Liu Bang was a peasant born scoundrel, a scamp who cheated, lied, and conned his way into becoming the first emperor of the Han Dynasty, one of China's golden ages. He rose to power by outwitting probably one of the mightiest warlords ancient China had ever seen, Xiang Yu. At the risk of sounding controversial, yeah, Xiang Yu was probably even stronger than the legendary Lu Bu. But just as Liu Bang thought that he had overcome the greatest challenge of his life, and he can now kick back and relax, enter Modu Shan Yu and his Xiongnu Empire. Now, with China once again united under one rule, can these step nomads provide any challenge at all? Well, let's find out. So, who were the Xiongnu? Since the dawn of Chinese history, during the pre-imperial dynasties of Xia, Sang, and Zhou, the various nomadic tribes around the ancient borders of China had been the silent players in ancient Chinese politics. They not only raided and traded with the various Chinese states, they often allied and worked as mercenaries for them too. Various names were used for them, Western Rong, Northern Di, and by the Warring States period, the generic term Hu was used for these nomads. Obviously, the groups within this category consisted of separate tribes and federations. But who the heck did surveys back then? So they just slapped the same label on all of them and call it a day. But by the time Qin Shi Huang had conquered the six states and united China, the group called Xiongnu had become a significant enough threat to warrant a distinct name. However, they had existed much further back than this, of course, with a long line of Shan Yus before Toman, the leader of the period. So in 215 BCE, Qin Shi Huang dispatched an army led by General Meng Tian, and he successfully drove them northwards. Following the victory, the Qin army connected the Great Walls and told the Xiongnu to stay out. Well, the Qin army was just too strong at the time, and with Meng Tian guarding the frontiers, they decided to turn their attention to their old rivalries with the Yue Zi and the Donghu instead. Contrary to common beliefs, the steppe nomads' greatest enemies were not the agrarian people they raided. Most of the time, these agriculturalists are at the mercy of the steppe nomads and their highly mobile raiding tactics. Meng Tian's victory was only possible through concerted efforts and the highly militarized Qin imperial policy. And that didn't happen too often throughout ancient history. Their real competitors were in fact other steppe nomads. The politics of the steppe is actually quite interesting. I think we should start looking into this by asking the question, why do steppe nomads raid? Hey, you know what day it is? Friday. Why? Oh, oh, it's... Raiding day! Let's raid! No, the steppe nomads like the Xiongnu, Scythian, and the Huns don't raid just because. These pastoralists have their livestock, and they can live a decent life sustained by their animals. Agricultural products are not an important part of their diet. And if they want to get some grains and veg, they can do it easily and peacefully, just by trading. But things get interesting when certain tribes and strongmen started to get ambitious. Loots acquired from raiding are prime political currency in their gift economy. Leaders gain political clout and attract other tribes into their confederacy by displaying their generosity and showering their followers with gifts. And a quick way to acquire these gifts that they can dole out is obviously through raiding. But the impulse to raid does not necessarily go just one top-down direction. It can go bottom-up, when the poorer members of the society or those affected by the pressure of climate change petition their leader to go raiding. So fluctuations in the climate and environmental changes can be a determining factor in their activity. This is why these nomadic steppe empires often prefer to raid and extort their settled neighbors rather than directly conquering them. They don't really need farmlands, just leave the farming to the farmers. They just want the goods. And just as John Green would say, the Mongols are an exception. It is also important to point out that the Xiongnu, like many other steppe confederacies, are heterogeneous. 
Recent studies revealed that they were ethnically and genetically diverse, and they often have mixed heritage. Even historian Sima Qian claimed that the Xiongnu shared common ancestry with the Chinese, and that they were the descendants of the rulers of the Xia dynasty by the name Chun Wei. But it is unlikely that he could acquire reliable information from such a distant past. This probably imagined kinship is most likely a product of the politics of Sima Qian's time, but it is something I will discuss next time. Various steppe tribes also had a lot of interaction between each other, intermarriage, alliance, war, and so on. Some of the notable ones during that time period were the Donghu, Wusun, and Yuezi. In fact, during this time, the Xiongnu had peaceful relationship with the Yuezi, and Toman's son and heir apparent, Modu, was living among the Yuezi as political hostage. With such high-profile hostage in hand, you would imagine that the Xiongnu would never attack the Yuezi, right? Wrong! That's exactly the reason why they are attacking. Toman actually had a younger son by a new favorite wife, who he was very fond of. And this is part of his scheme to manipulate the Yuezi to get rid of Modu for him, so his younger son can become the new heir. The scheme almost worked, but Modu managed to escape by stealing a good horse. When he returned home, Toman was disappointed, but he was also impressed by Modu's hardiness. So he put Modu in charge of a 10,000 strong cavalry force. By any measure, having your father plot your death is a messed up experience. But Modu is not the gentle snowflake who would fall into a mopey depression. He is the kind of guy who would get even. So he made some whistling arrows and used them to train his army to be completely obedient. He told his warriors that they must shoot at whatever his whistling arrows strike or they will be cut down. At first, he started with some easy tests. He brought his men to a hunting trip, and whenever some of them failed to shoot at the target of his whistling arrows, as promised, he would cut them down. Then, the test started to get progressively more extreme. Next, he shot his whistling arrow at his best horse. Some of them hesitated and failed to shoot at the horse, so they were executed. Later on, he picked another difficult target. This time, it was his favorite wife. Again, some of them hesitated, and they were executed. But by now, most of his men had learned their lesson. If they wanted to live, don't think, just shoot. Then, the next target he presented them was his father's finest horse. And this time, every single one of them shot at the target without hesitation. Satisfied by their complete obedience, Finally, Modu carried out the final phase of his plan. He invited his father to a hunting trip, and in the middle of the hunt, he aimed his whistling arrow at him and let it loose. With the death of his father, Modu returned to camp and eradicated all of his oppositions. His stepmother was executed, his younger brother executed, his father's loyalists all executed. And so in the year 209 BCE, he became the new Sun Yu. But the Xiongnu was still small and weak at the time, and the big dog in the playground was the Donghu. Hearing that Modu had killed his own father and became the new Sun Yu, they decided to send an envoy to pay him a visit. Oh, nice horse! This is another one of your father's fine horses, eh? Since he is dead now, can we have it? Modu's ministers were offended by the request, but Modu gave the horse to them anyway. Then, thinking that Modu was a chump, the Donghu goons decided to go a step further and ask for his wife. Despite much protest by his ministers, again he granted the request. Well, since he was a total pushover, they thought, they might as well ask for more. This time, they asked for a stretch of wasteland between their borders. By now, the ministers have learned to see the pattern, so some of them just agreed to give it away. But no! Land is the basis of the nation, Modu said. Why should I give it away? And he executed his ministers who were willing to give up the land. Modu was as unpredictable as he was tough. 
he immediately circulated an order throughout his domain, and whoever was too slow to join his assault on the Donghu will be executed. So, with the swift mobilization of his army, Moru surprised the Donghu and crushed them. After this victory, he then turned west and attacked the Yuezi, defeating them. Riding on this wave of victories, Moru then turned his attention southwards. By this time, General Meng Tian had already died. He and Qin Zi Huang's crown prince, Fu Su, were victims of Qin Palace intrigue. Soon after, the Qin dynasty was also overthrown by popular uprising, and China was in turmoil as various warlords such as Liu Bang and Xiang Yu contended for supremacy. So Modu easily reclaimed the land the Xiongnu had lost. As Modu conquered and absorbed more surrounding tribes, the Xiongnu Empire grew into a formidable force. Meanwhile, down south, Liu Bang won his power struggle against Xiang Yu with the assistance of his general, Han Xin, and he established the Han Dynasty in 202 BCE. To be honest, it was really Han Xin who won the war for him. And Han Xin became so powerful, Liu Bang got worried about his growing influence. But luck was always on Liu Bang's side. The discovery of Han Xin harboring a fugitive gave Liu Bang the excuse to demote him and get rid of him from the political scene. Eventually, this political spat will culminate into Han Xin's execution in 196 BCE. The point I'm trying to make here is that as the Xiongnu's are descending upon them and a war was looming, Liu Bang had just decommissioned his best general. Not very smart. Instead, what Liu Bang did was relocate a minor king to the north to defend against the Xiongnu, and by some strange coincidence, he was also named Han Xin. It is usually quite rare for Chinese to have the same name since there are so many characters to choose from. But just to be clear, this Han Xin is not Liu Bang's general who went by the same name. Interestingly, this guy seemed to be really eager to accept his new assignment. He wanted to be sent as close as possible to the front line, so his request was granted. In 201 BCE, Modu besieged the city King Han Xin was stationed in, so Liu Bang sent a force to relieve him. But then, he discovered that Han Xin was negotiating peace with the Xiongnu without his imperial approval, so he saw it as a conspiracy. Fearing punishment from the emperor, Han Xin actually defected to the Xiongnu and turned against Liu Bang. Enraged by this turn of events, Liu Bang personally led an army against the turncoat. He easily crushed the combined forces of Han Xin and Xiongnu and made the king flee into Xiongnu territory. But some of Han Xin's men remained and they reorganized their army. Supported by a detachment of 10,000 Xiongnu cavalrymen sent by Mo Du, they attacked Liu Bang's force, but they were easily routed. But then they reformed again and attacked again, constantly harassing the Han forces. This happened quite a few times until the winter came and most of Liu Bang's army was frostbitten. Liu Bang knew that he shouldn't let the war drag on. He needed to finish it quickly. By luck, he received news that Mo Du himself was stationed in a nearby city, so he sent out his scout to spy on Mo Du's army. They returned with news that Mo Du only had old and weak Xiongnu soldiers stationed there. This news delighted Liu Bang, but his minister, Lou Jing, was immediately alarmed. This doesn't make sense, he thought. During war, the opposing sides always put up a strong front. The fact that Mo Du's men looked weak could indicate a trap. As Liu Bang hesitated, Modu left the city. Furious at this lost opportunity, Liu Bang jailed Lo Jing and quickly pursued Modu with his small force, ahead of his main force of 320,000 strong army. And it didn't take long until he realized that his minister was right all along. Liu Bang was soon surrounded at Baiteng by Modu's 400,000 strong army, and he had no way of getting reinforcement. So Liu Bang was trapped. After seven days of encirclement, food started to run low. Everything looked bleak for Liu Bang. But if you know anything about this man, then you would know that he is prodigiously shameless and there is no method of survival beneath him. So he sent a secret envoy to bribe Modu's wife. And with her urging, Modu relaxed his defenses 
So Liu Bang used the opportunity to break out of the encirclement. Thus, that's how the historically important but factually disappointing Battle of Baiteng ended. When he returned, Liu Bang released Lou Jing and personally apologized to him before promoting him to a marquee. He then asked Lou Jing how he should deal with the Xiongnu. The Han Empire had just recovered from a devastating civil war, and the people were exhausted. So Lou Jing suggested to use a long-term peaceful mean to culturally convert them by marriage alliances. This policy is known as He Qing. So they were able to negotiate a peace treaty, and as part of the deal, the Han Empire will have to send periodical tributes in the form of silk, wine, other goods, and brides for their leaders. Or they will risk a large-scale invasion. Liu Bang wanted to give away his eldest daughter to Mo Tu, but due to his wife's objection, he lied to them and sent a distant relative instead. Nevertheless, with this treaty, Mo Tu won the opening round in the first conflict between the Xiongnu and Han. Fueled by this tribute, the Xiongnu Empire eventually grew to a size larger than Alexander the Great's own empire. But this uneasy relationship will eventually spill into a proper war a few decades later in a centuries-long conflict called the Han Xiongnu War. Emboldened by their superior position, when Liu Bang died, Modu even sent a mocking letter to the widowed Empress Liu, offering to marry her and cure her loneliness. Boy, was she livid when she received the letter. But all the ministers were just too scared of the Xiongnu and argued against starting a war with them. In 177 BCE, after a raid by the Xiongnu Empire's Tu Qi, wise king of the right, Emperor Wen, the fifth emperor of Han, could only raise a mild protest regarding the incident. Just to explain how the Xiongnu hierarchy worked, the absolute ruler of the Xiongnu Empire was the Shan Yu, but under him are two autonomous kings, the Tu Qi, or wise king of the left and right, who usually just do whatever they want, unless the Shan Yu tell them otherwise. They were located in the east and west respectively. Just imagine a southward facing orientation to make it easy to remember. When the reply from the Xiongnu arrived, it was really just a humble bragging letter from Mo Du. Yeah, yeah, the wise king of the right was being very naughty. So as punishment, I sent him to the west to terminate the Yuezi and conquer the Wusun, Roran and the other tribes. And just so you know, the Xiongnu Empire is now officially the biggest empire in the world. Um, you know what? Let's continue being friends, <laughs> the emperor replied. Okay, it looks like they are not going to stop raiding anytime soon. But on another note, how did the civilizing process go? Well, there was a hitch. During one of the He Qing exchanges, when a member of a royal family was married off, a very reluctant eunuch was sent along with a bride. His name was Zhong Hang Yue. He really didn't want to go to live among the Xiongnu in the boondocks. If you send me away, then I promise I will become Han Dynasty's worst nightmare. He was still sent away, and he kept his promise. Over there at the Xiongnu side, he ingratiated himself to Mo Du's son, the new Sun Yu. He improved the Xiongnu bureaucracy and preached the superiority of Xiongnu culture, thus becoming the first Xiongnu Abu in history. What need do we have for silk? They tear easily and they are not even as good as the hide and leather the Xiongnu wear. They probably find him quite cringy because silk was still a very expensive item that they can sell somewhere else for a good price. But at least he is on their side, and the Xiongnu can be quite generous when it comes to rewarding individuals who impressed them. Those stingy Han imperialists only sent a fifth of their goods here. How dare they? If Zhong Hang Yue's complaint, which was written in the records, can be believed, then a fifth of Han Dynasty's income is a massive amount of resources that they are giving away to the Xiongnu for nothing. So this raises the question, how was Han Dynasty doing at this time? 
with this kind of economic burden, are they even okay? Surprisingly, they are doing really well. They made a lot of economic reforms and became quite rich, entering their golden age even. So that's why they would rather keep their heads down and quietly make their cha-ching. Liu Bang was born a peasant, and his policies favored the peasants too. However, wealth and power gradually shifted towards the noble elites. Besides the widening inequality, it also created the danger of internal instability. In fact, the Han dynasty had experienced two political upheavals before Han Wu Di's time. The first one was the Lü clan disturbance, when Empress Lü, Liu Bang's wife's relatives, tried to seize power in 180 BCE, and the rebellion of the seven states in 154 BCE, when other members of the Liu royal family rebelled against the emperor. Han Wu Di finally entered the picture in 141 BCE and became the seventh emperor of the Han dynasty. His personal name was Liu Ce, but he was better known by his ancestral name, Han Wu Di. So I will just call him that. Anyway, there was obviously something exceptional about him because he became the crown prince despite not being the eldest son. He was only 15 or 16 according to East Asian age reckoning when he became emperor. Uh, what, does he look old for a 16-year-old? Well, you would imagine that he would probably look that old already with all the pressure to fix the current state of the empire weighing on his shoulder. But Han Wudi hit the ground running. The first thing he needed to do was to rein in the nobles and centralize the government. So on the first year of his rule, this teenager enacted a series of reforms, which became known as the Jianyuan Reforms. Impressed by the essay of Confucian scholar Dong Zhongshu, he made Confucianism the official philosophy and banned other ideas. He sought to regulate the aristocrats' power and excesses, and to build his own power base, he promoted the recruitment of talented commoners into the government. This last reform would be the precursor of the imperial examination system in China. The point is, he needed to build a loyal support base so that his plans and policies won't be detracted. Like this one. This ambitious reform was smacked down right off the bat by his own grandmother, Empress Dowager Dou. If you think that old white men are good at clinging on to power, then you have never heard of old Asian Amas. They are forces of nature, I tell you. As easy as flipping her palm, she dashed his plans and executed his ministers. She had a hand at making the empire prosperous. She is not about to let this young whippersnapper ruin everything she and her extended family had worked for. His reforms will never see the light of day while she is alive. So Han Wu Di was politically neutered for the first few years of his rule, and this move had made him so much enemies, he was practically public enemy number one in his own court. They even tried to depose him with whatever reason they could find, including accusing him of being infertile and not producing an heir. So he secretly built his power base. He recruited and promoted promising young officials to become part of his faction his inner court, so that he can one day challenge the old guards who he considered to be the outer court. As he was counting the seconds until his grandma kicks the bucket, Han Wu Di still had to adhere to the terms of He Qing. He married off another relative to the Shan Yu and paid his tribute. But the Xiongnu never stopped their raids. The minister's constant refrain was that they were just too weak and war was just too costly. However, the threat of Xiongnu had never left his mind. Then, one day, in 138 BCE, they managed to extract intel from a Xiongnu prisoner of war and learned about the survival of the Yuezi tribe that was Xiongnu's greatest enemy. This is great news. They could launch a pincer attack on the Xiongnu if they could just form an alliance with the Yuezi. And to do so, he just needed a volunteer to travel across the perilous enemy-infested steps to find them. And among all of his ministers, only Zhang Qian was brave or foolish enough 
to step forward. So off he went with a hundred other men and a Xiongnu slave who served as his guide. But this poor sap didn't know what he signed up for. His mission will end up being an epic 13 years adventure. But that's a story for another episode in the series. And then, an interesting event happened down south in the same year. The kingdom of Tong O requested intervention against the kingdom of Minyue's invasion. The ministers argued whether they should interfere in the Yue people's affairs. But the interventionist camp won, and Han Wu Di sent them support. The Minyue army surrendered without a fight and promptly left once they found out that the Han army was coming. So, yay, mini victory! Unbeknownst to him, this small, seemingly independent action will eventually lead to the conquest of the South. But that's a story for a different episode too. A few years later, the Han Empire finally saw some real action when the Minyue attacked Nanyue, and the latter requested Han to intervene. So they did. And perhaps for the first time in a very long time, the Han army tasted victory. Oh my gosh, we are not complete wimps! And boy, they can't get the sweet taste of victory out of their mind. On the same year, the Empress Dowager To passed away. Finally, Han Wu Di could carry out his long-awaited reforms. And now, with everything falling into place, he started to entertain this wild, wild idea that's been brewing in the back of his mind for a while. Maybe it is time to finally challenge the Xiongnu. No, no, no. Zhang Qian had not even returned yet, and the Xiongnu was still a force to be reckoned with. Now, if only there is a brilliant way to launch a surprise attack. Then a merchant called Mie Yi came up with a brilliant idea. And then what happened next was Nie Yi running off to the Sun Yu, requesting protection. He had become a fugitive of the Han Empire, he said. And in exchange for the Shan Yu's protection, he was willing to kill the local magistrate of Ma Yi and offer the city to him. That sounded like a pretty good deal to the Shan Yu, so he agreed. But not long after the Sun Yu entered the territory, he started to smell something fishy. Everything seemed to be going too smoothly. Too impossibly silky smooth! In fact, he even saw fields of cattle without even a herder watching it. So the suspicious Sun Yu captured a minor officer and interrogated him. And this one officer spilled all the beans and ruined the whole operation. He told the Xiongnu that there were actually 300,000 Han soldiers hiding all around who were ready to ambush and encircle him at a moment's notice. Shocked by this revelation, the Shan Yu immediately retreated with his whole force. He was so grateful for the information, he actually gave the officer the rank of Heavenly King. Wang Hui, the general in charge of the operation, was supposed to pursue the Xiongnu with his small contingent of 30,000. But seeing that there were still a 100,000 Xiongnu on the opposing side, he decided not to. Hey, look! I saved 30,000 troops from complete annihilation. That should count for something, right? Well, Han Wu Di didn't think so, and he was jailed. So the first operation against the Xiongnu was a complete botch up. But there can be no backseas in war. And this incident was a clear indicator to both sides that the age of meek diplomacy had ended, and this incident marked the official beginning of the centuries-long Han Xiongnu War. The failure of this operation actually exposed a massive weakness in the outdated military paradigm of the Han Empire. They could easily amass 300,000 soldiers against the Xiongnu's 100,000. But the problem is that the Han army was mostly composed of chariots and infantry, and the Xiongnu could easily run circles around them with their cavalry, or they could just draw them deep into the steps and then hit their overdrawn supply train to cripple them and finish them off when they are exhausted. This is the typical Xiongnu modus operandi, and it had always worked thus far. 
military traditionalists like Cao Zuo claimed that the Han crossbow was more powerful than the Xiongnu's composite bows. The Han military also had better quality iron weaponry and armor. If the Xiongnu had dismounted, then they are no match for the Han army. Well, yeah, that might be true. But why in the world would the Xiongnu be stupid enough to dismount and put themselves at a disadvantage? So at best, the old guards of the Han military would mount a formidable defense against the Xiongnu's raids. But usually, the Xiongnu would just attack suddenly at an unguarded spot and leave before the main Han force could arrive. And they can't do anything about it. One of these old guards was the famous flying general Li Guang. Good old General Li Guang was an accomplished warrior. He received his nickname from the Xiongnu, and his presence was sometimes enough to make them abandon the city they are besieging. Not only that, he was a pretty swell old dude. He is not a man of many words, but he loved his underlings. He would share his rewards with them, eat with them, and everyone loved him. Han Wu Di's grandfather even once said that if he was born earlier, in the time of Liu Bang, the first emperor of Han, then he could have easily been made a marquee of 10,000 households. And this rank eventually became his lifelong goal. But by the time of Han Wu Di, he is turning into somewhat of a joke, an outdated dinosaur plagued with a dark cloud of bad luck. And he wasn't a marquee yet. Han Wu Di knew that he couldn't rely on the old ways anymore. So he had to turn to someone younger and more reliable. Wei Qing, he was the stepbrother of Han Wu Di's new concubine, Wei Zifu, who would later be promoted to be his new empress. Wei Zifu was originally a singing servant, gifted to Han Wu Di by his sister in 139 BCE. But she proved to be a wise and diligent partner for him and became part of his inner circle against the ministers who conspired against him. Many of her family members eventually became Han Wu Di's trusted officials. Wei Qing had a humble origin. He entered the royal palace as part of her entourage and served as Han Wu Di's royal guard. He was a bastard son of a minor official and Wei Zifu's mother. He was practically a nobody. But after becoming a victim of a palace intrigue involving getting kidnapped by a jealous empress's mother-in-law, he was promoted to a high rank by the emperor just so he can spite his in-laws. There were just so many inner court intrigue during Han Wudi's time, it would make multiple 50 episodes drama. In fact, they did. So I'm not going to go too deep into this. Despite gaining his position inadvertently through his boss's deadly marital spat, Wei Qing turned out to be a very humble and capable general. In 129 BCE, after suffering another Xiongnu raid, Wei Qing was appointed as General of Chariot and Cavalry. He was sent out with Li Guang and two other generals with 10,000 cavalry each. They had middling success. Li Guang's unit was defeated. He barely escaped capture by pretending to be dead and stole a horse from a Xiongnu kid. Wei Qing's unit, on the other hand, snuck up to the Xiongnu holy site in Longcheng and killed 700 soldiers and officers. Despite the unimpressive result, a win was still a win, and he was the first general to have scored a blow against the Xiongnu in their own territory. This marked a shift in the Han military policy. In the past, the Han military boasted a massive infantry army of hundreds and thousands. But in the end, they all proved to be ineffective. So now they have learned that to beat the Xiongnu, you have to become exactly like them. With their elite, highly mobile cavalry units, they can flank, outmaneuver, and surprise the Xiongnu in the same way. Note that the 10,000 men cavalry units also resembled the Turkic and Mongol organization of 10,000 men, a Tumen. This shift in policy was actually made possible through the long-term planning of previous emperors. They had been procuring horses for generations to build up their cavalry, and they settled the frontiers with migrants and recruiting friendly tribes. Training a combatant cavalry used to take generations, because mounted archery used to be a lot more difficult. 
the stirrup wasn't used in pairs yet. Back then, they only had mounting stirrup on one side. If they had the proper stirrup pair, then they could stand on the stirrup to compensate for the horse's gallop and shoot any time, or even do more complex maneuvers like shoot backwards. Without two stirrups, they can only match their shot to the rhythm of the horse's gallop. The best time to shoot is to wait for the time all the horse's legs leave the ground. When the horse is floating briefly, it is the most stable time to shoot. Of course, this is easier said than done. It is actually a lot harder to do in the heat of a battle. Anyway, with Wei Qing in command and this new military policy, the Han army started to win their battles. Even if they could not crush the Xiongnu's in the battlefield, since part of the Xiongnu strategy is to scatter quickly and regroup later, they were able to decapitate the Xiongnu army by seeking out their commanders and eliminate them. In 124 BCE, Wei Qing managed to send the Tu Qi, wise king of the right, running and captured 15,000 Xiongnu, some minor kings and a million livestock. That was quite a victory back then. Huo Chubing, the young hotshot general, entered the battlefield in 123 BCE. He was the nephew of Wei Qing. Han Wu Di was impressed by his talents early on and made him a captain serving under his uncle at the tender age of just 18. On his first campaign, he outshined his uncle by going deep into enemy territory with only 800 riders and killed the Shan Yu's own grandfather and also 2,000 enemy warriors. The boy was patriotic, worked hard, and played hard. He was not a young man of many words. He was temperamental, and he gave little regards for his soldiers' well-being. He was also known to force them to play Zhu Ju, an ancient game of Chinese football, while they were hungry during a campaign. In 120 BCE, Huo Chu Bing was deployed twice to secure the Hexi Corridor. This time, he was joined by Li Guang and Zhang Qian. Zhang Qian had finally returned from his 13 years mission earlier in 126 BCE, and he brought news of the existence of the Silk Road Network. The plan here is to cut off the Xiongnu who acted as the middleman and reap the economic benefits for themselves so that they can continue to fund their war. Due to Li Guang's bad luck, Zhang Qian, who was supposed to rendezvous with him, was delayed. So he was outnumbered by the Xiongnu and lost half his troops, and along with it, his chance to be promoted into a marquee again. Huo Chubing, on the other hand, just kept winning. His victories led to an internal discord among the Xiongnu, which in turn led to the defection of some minor tribes to the Han Empire. This signified a major turn in the tides of war. This time, it was the Xiongnu who feared the Han army, and they moved their camp to the north of the Gobi Desert to use the terrain as deterrent. This move did not deter Han Wu Di one bit, who at the time thought that the time had finally come to deal the Xiongnu a decisive blow. He dispatched Wei Qing and Huo Chu Bing giving them a chariot and cavalry force of 50,000 each. Having received a tip-off from a captured Xiongnu officer, they thought that the Sun Yu was in the east, so Huo Chubing was ordered to seek him out. As for Wei Qing, he just followed the original plan. But he was also given the extra responsibility to babysit Li Guang, who had come under his command. This old badger was still hungry for that marquee position. He petitioned hard to be picked as the vanguard. But knowing his atrocious bad luck, Han Wu Di secretly ordered Wei Qing to not let him do it. So Wei Qing ordered Li Guang to march along a different route so that they can outflank the Xiongnu army. Thus, the stage is set for the Battle of Mo Bei, or Desert North. Huo Chu Bing marched north and met the Xiongnu's wise king of the left in the battlefield. He defeated his enemies and captured the king and many officials. He seized their provision and used it to march all the way to Lake Baikal, deep into Xiongnu territory, and captured over 70,000 Xiongnu soldiers and officers. He lost only 10,000. 
his campaign was a resounding success. But the Sun Yu was nowhere to be found. Apparently, the intel they received was incorrect. The Sun Yu was actually lying in ambush by Wei Qing's side. When Wei Qing came across the Shan Yu's army, they were already in battle formation. So he reacted by circling the chariots to form a defensive barrier. Chariots had become outdated in the battlefield in this age of cavalry warfare. But Wei Qing was able to find a new use for it. But still, he was outnumbered and Li Guang was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, at midday, a sandstorm descended upon the battleground. Using the poor visibility to his advantage, Wei Qing outflanked the Shan Yu's army from both sides. This maneuver caused the Shan Yu to abandon his army and flee. As they battled past sunset, the Xiongnu army eventually dispersed. Not wanting to give them the chance to regroup, Wei Qing immediately pursued the Shan Yu into the night. After days of pursuit, ultimately, Wei Qing failed to catch him. But along the way, he managed to destroy their main food storage and killed a total of 19,000 enemies. Yet, Li Guang was still nowhere to be seen. Apparently, he had lost his way, and he only managed to regroup with the rest of Wei Qing's army on his return from his Feric victory. Greatly embarrassed by this blunder, Li Guang eventually committed suicide under the questioning of imperial inspectors. This victory dealt a massive blow to the Xiongnu Empire. The war will last for a couple more centuries, but this loss had sent them into a protracted downward spiral from which they will never recover. Never again will the Xiongnu Empire regain its former glory. Did the Xiongnu Empire that terrorized the Han Dynasty in China move to Europe and became the Huns that terrorized the Roman Empire? The general idea is no longer controversial. But the devil is in the details as historians argue about the specifics. So in this episode, I am going to talk about what happened to the Xiongnu after the Han Xiongnu War and how they could have moved to Europe. In the first century, the Xiongnu Empire had broken apart into two entities. The Northern Xiongnu, which ended up moving west, and the Southern Xiongnu, which melded with other people groups in China. To know how they got here, let's jump a couple of centuries back and do a quick recap. Since the dawn of Chinese history, before Qin Shi Huang unified China, various nomadic tribes had lived in the periphery of the various states of China. Sometimes they raid these sedentary states, at other times, they formed alliance with them to serve as mercenaries. And the Xiongnu Confederacy were just one among many nomadic people groups. After Qin Shi Huang completed his conquest of China in 221 BCE, he found them to be the last lingering threat to his rule. So he attacked them and drove them northwards. At that time, the Xiongnu Confederacy was not the most prominent force in the steppes yet. They were rivaled by other nomadic groups such as the Yuezi to the west and the Donghu to the east. But after the Xiongnu prince, Modu seized the reign of leadership from his father, Toman, and became the San Yu, he was able to quickly defeat these rival groups and greatly expanded the confederacy into an empire. Meanwhile, down south, the Qing dynasty had been overthrown and the Han dynasty emerged from the ashes of a very bloody power struggle. Unsurprisingly, this fragile newborn dynasty was easily defeated by the Xiongnu. And for survival, the Han dynasty negotiated a humiliating peace treaty which was known as the Heqing Treaty. As part of the deal, the Xiongnu will stop their raids. But the Han Empire had to send hefty tributes to the Xiongnu and marry off their princesses to the Xiongnu royalty. Since then, the fates of these two empires became inextricably linked, and the balance of power kept seesawing between the two. Funded by the tributes, the Xiongnu was able to expand and eventually became the largest empire in the world at the time they drove their old rival, the Yuezi, further west, 
and absorbed smaller tribes they defeated into their mix, such as the Wu Sun. It is important to keep in mind that the Xiongnu Empire, like the other nomadic empires, was made up of loose confederacy of different tribes of different ethnicity, culture, and language groups. And the membership can be very fluid. For example, the Wu Sun will eventually break away once they have gained enough power and the confidence to ignore the Xiongnu's orders. Confederacies can also split, such as the Donghu split into the Xianbei and Wu Huan after their defeat by the Xiongnu. Given the existence of so many tribes within the group and their political structure that granted great amount of autonomy to their subordinates, they couldn't visibly stop all the raids into the Han Empire. It's like herding cats. So despite the Han Dynasty sticking to the Heqing Treaty, they still suffered from periodic raids. But by the time Han Wu Di, the seventh emperor of the Han Dynasty, ascended to the throne, the Han Empire had built up enough economic and military strength to fight back. So he stopped the Heqing Treaty and launched a series of successful campaigns against them. In his lifetime, he greatly expanded the Han Empire and weakened the Xiongnu. Not long after his death, the Xiongnu entered into a civil war caused by succession crisis. Ah, they had plenty of those. And to secure his position in the empire, the Shan Yu at the time, Hu Han Ye, made a proverbial deal with the devil and submitted to the Han Dynasty so that he can defeat his rivals. This is the Xiongnu Empire at one of its lowest points. But the twists and turns of fate reversed the situation by the next century when Wang Mang usurped the throne of the Han Dynasty and established the short-lived Xing Dynasty. The political upheaval leading up to the revival of the Han Dynasty severely weakened them. The Xiongnu even floated the idea of reversing the tributary relationship to have the Han Dynasty be the subordinates again. But another succession crisis struck when Hu Duerzi wanted to have his son, Pu Nu, succeed him. This is contrary to the succession rules set up by his predecessor, Hu Han Ye. The adult brother of the Shan Yu had priority over the Shan Yu's son to the throne. This time, the rift caused an irreparable split between the different Xiongnu factions, and B, the Shan Yu's brother, took eight tribes with him and formed the Southern Xiongnu. He then submitted to the Han Dynasty to gain support and funding to fight the war against his nephew's faction, which had come to be known as the Northern Xiongnu. The thing about the Xiongnu is that their worst enemies are not the sedentary agrarian people like the Chinese, Persians, or Romans. Their greatest enemies were actually other nomadic tribes, especially themselves. The Han Empire's policy to fund the Southern Xiongnu worked really well. The destruction of the Northern Xiongnu was practically set on auto-drive by then. The Southern Xiongnu allied themselves with the Xianbei and other tribes to deal significant blows to the Northern Xiongnu. And finally, in the Battle of the Altai Mountains, when the Han forces finally destroyed the Northern Xiongnu's political structure, the bulk of the combatants on their side were actually from Southern Xiongnu, the Han army probably could have just sat and watched the fight unfold. By the end of this battle, 200,000 Xiongnu from 81 tribes surrendered to the Han army. The rest of them would probably have moved westward. But the ones that stayed nearby were absorbed into the Xianbei Confederacy in the 2nd century. From here on, the fates of the northern and southern Xiongnu diverged greatly. Information on the Northern Xiongnu is a bit patchy, so to give us better context on what might have happened to them, let's look at what happened to the Southern Xiongnu. To secure the Southern Xiongnu's allegiance for future generations, the Han Empire resettled them along the northern frontiers in mixed Han Xiongnu settlement. But by the end of the second century, the Han Dynasty started to unravel frayed by corruption and eunuch-led factionalism. With its collapse, China became a battleground for famous warlords such as Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and Sun Jian. 
Cao Cao, having the advantage of controlling the northern part of China, subjugated various nomadic tribes, Wu Huan, Xianbei, Xiongnu, etc., and incorporated them into his army. He also divided the Xiongnu into five. Through the Three Kingdoms period and beyond, the Xiongnu and other groups pretty much served as mercenaries to whichever faction that are willing to secure their allegiance. And by the time of the Jing Dynasty, a civil war known as the War of the Eight Princes opened up the floodgates for various nomadic tribes to enter China. They were invited in by various factions that are eager to borrow their power. But eventually, they started to develop their own ambition for the imperial throne, leading to the event known as the Uprising of the Five Barbarians, as five major groups, Xiongnu, Di, Jie, Qiang, and Xianbei, established their own kingdoms and joined the fray in the battle for the dominion of China. This period is known as the Sixteen Kingdoms period, due to the many kingdoms that rose and fell quickly in the north, like a game of whack-a-mole, except bloodier. Different branches of the Xiongnu established their own kingdoms during this period. One of them, led by Liu Yao, even established a kingdom called Han, later referred by historians as Han Zhao. Yes, as you might have guessed, he claimed to be the descendants of the Han emperors through the He Qing marriage policy, and his family even changed their surnames to Liu, the surname of the Han royal family. That's a pretty clever hustle, if you ask me. But eventually, all the Xiongnu's end up getting conquered by another group of nomadic people, the Toba tribe of the Xianbei, who would establish the Northern Wei dynasty, the dynasty which scholars speculated to be the setting for the Ballad of Mulan. Eventually, the Southern Xiongnu lost their identity as they assimilated into the Toba Wei dynasty. As we have seen, these nomadic confederacies have very fluid form of membership and hierarchy, as the Toba rose above the other Xianbei tribes and established Northern Wei, so did the Guizhuang rose out of the Yuezi and established the Kushan Empire located in today's Pakistan. As for the Northern Xiongnu, it is hard to say for certain what actually happened to them. Historians are still debating the specifics but they have found a few clues that can be used to trace the movement of the northern Xiongnu to the west. The main evidence for their shared origin is the similarity of their names. Xiongnu, pronounced in ancient Chinese, would probably sound something like Hunlu, and there are various nomadic people groups appearing throughout Central Asia, all the way to Europe, bearing similar names. Additionally, a series of bronze cauldron with similar designs to the ones used by the Xiongnu were discovered along the supposed migration route. Using these evidence, they speculated that the process of their migration would probably have looked something like this. After the Battle of the Altai Mountains, some of the northern Xiongnu settled in the Altai, and between the 2nd and 3rd century, some of them split into the Yueban Xiongnu, or the Weak Xiongnu, which eventually settled in Zetishu, displacing the Wu Sun. Meanwhile, the other group moved further west and became the Iranian Huns and the European Huns. The Iranian Huns settled in Central Asia and became part of the various groups of nomadic people, such as the Sionites, Kidarites, Alkhon Huns, Nezek Huns, and Hephthalites. Due to the intermarriage and the revolving door of tribal affiliation, it is very difficult to know the exact composition of these groups, and how many of the original Xiongnu tribes remained was unknown. As for the European Huns, they moved even further west, and if the name doesn't make it obvious, yes, they moved to Europe. Around the 370s, they overwhelmed the Alans and Goths, taking some into their ranks and drove the rest to the south of the Danube, where they eventually came into conflict with the Romans. The Huns would eventually conquer Scythia and Germania before they came knocking on the gates of Rome. And the rest is history. Now that we have brought the Han Xiongnu War series to a close, on the next episode, I will set up the stage for the Tang Dynasty series by spotlighting the dynasty that preceded it. 
the Sui Dynasty. So subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss it. If you would like to participate in the discussion and vote on future topics, then be a pro and join us on Patreon. You can also help the channel by liking, sharing, and commenting. It boosts the YouTube algorithm. Until next time, stay cool, my bros.